Right, well, thank you all for coming tonight. The title of tonight's talk is The UK in Europe, New Perspectives, with Alex Andreu and Annette Dittert. Firstly, on behalf of Oxford for Europe, I just wanted to say how sorry we all are to hear of the catastrophic floods in Germany. It's devastating to hear of lives lost, and we know how traumatising this can be for people and communities, and we're thinking of Germany at this time. Um, but let's go back to the talk now, the, the, the UK and Europe. The pain of Brexit is growing daily, with businesses unable to trade and creative industries unable to tour, fishermen unable to fish, students choosing to go elsewhere. But despite this evidence of Brexit harms and broken promises, and the harm to our international relations, and acutely with the EU, polling evidence suggests still that the public have barely changed its views on the Brexit issue, and Brexit reality hasn't appeared to have taken a chunk out of Johnson, Johnson's popularity, perhaps because the reality is to some extent hidden by COVID. Nevertheless, his enduring popularity perplexes many of us here. So in looking for answers, we thought to turn to two political commentators, both born in other European countries, but who live in England. Perhaps their perspectives will shed light or, or, or offer a new lens through which to see ourselves and the journey ahead for us. And I'm absolutely delighted to welcome our two speakers tonight, Alex Andreu and Annette Dittert. Unfortunately, due to circumstances beyond anyone's control, we only have Alex until eight o'clock. So we're going to hear from Alex first, then from Annette, and then we will take questions. And where applicable, we'll direct the questions more appropriate for Alex in the first part because so that he is able to leave at eight. Each speaker will speak for about 15 minutes. After about 20 minutes, I'll have to bring their talk to a close and make time for questions. For those who've been here before, the Q&A works slightly differently. Please put your questions in the Q&A function of the webinar you should see the icon at the bottom of your screen. You can vote for the questions in that Q&A and that saves having multiple questions on the same topic. So back to the speakers. Our first speaker tonight is Alex Andreu. Alex is a lawyer, trade expert, journalist, actor, singer, <laughs> chef, author. He is the inaugural winner of the Jane Grigson Award for his book, The Magic Bayleaf. Alex has lived in the UK for many years and is known to many for his insightful commentary as a co-host on the Oh God, What Now, formerly Romaniacs podcast and the Bunker podcast. I think this tweet, sum, tweet sums up why we need him as a commentator. He said a few days ago, as Brexit dividends go, I had not anticipated the economy will have such damage inflicted on it and government will be so terrified of voters finding out they were conned It'll bribe car manufacturers to keep factories in the UK. If only Justin Webb had the courage to say that kind of truth on the Today <laughs> programme, then we would all really wake up. So without further ado, ado our first speaker, Alex Andreu. Thank you. Thank you for that very kind introduction. Um, I'm sure I'm not going to need 15 minutes for what I have to say as an opening um, salvo. Um, what I wanted to talk about uh, really was the conditions that will need to uh, exist in order for the UK to start drifting back towards uh, a relationship, a better, closer relationship with the European Union and eventually rejoining. Um, they are, as I see them, threefold. So firstly, there needs to be a government that wants a closer relationship with the European Union. Secondly, the people of the UK need to want a closer relationship with the European Union in large numbers, in, in a significant majority. And the third condition is that Europe has to want us back. Europe has to want a closer relationship with the UK. Um, the reason I'm identifying those three things is because each of them has several stages in order to get there. And so, for instance, if we look at the first condition, which is that we need a government that wants a closer relationship with the um, EU, this, that will never be this government. Which, because to do so would be to admit that they got the biggest political call 
of their career wrong. So it would be to admit that actually there is strength in uh, cooperation that, you know, it, it, no country is an island, even when it is an island or a set of islands. Um, and so that brings us to the previous step, which says we need a change of government. That's a precondition for that to happen. And in order for a change of government to happen, I think we need a progressive alliance. So that's where my logic leads me. My logic leads me to conclude that there is a majority in this country that wants a close relationship with Europe, that wants progressive politics, that wants fairness and equality, but they are constantly thwarted by an electoral system which favors minority support concentrated in particular areas. So that to me is a very big thing. I think rather than, you know, just tweeting loads of stuff with hashtag rejoin, we need to be rational about it and analyze the steps we need to take towards that goal. And to me, the first one is some kind of pro progressive cooperation, whether uh, formal, formal or informal, whether in a few seats, uh, or many seats, we need some sort of cooperation in order to ensure that there is a majority government, because what we've had for many, many years now is a minority government. The second step is that uh, Lizzie, the people of this country- Any questions Sorry. coming in, full stop. Can you remind people? Sorry. Sorry. Is that okay? That's all right. Um, so the second step that we need is for the people of this country to want a closer relationship with the EU. And that is also a process. I think a lot of um, people who support it remain, and that includes me, by the way. I make this mistake all the time because it's an emotional thing to do. And of course, I fall into that trap. I want a sort of public conversion. I want a public apology from the people who supported the Brexit project. I want them to stand up publicly and say, I was wrong. I got it wrong. It was a terrible decision to vote for it. It was a disaster. And then I think to myself, by demanding that, I actually make it more difficult for people to change their mind. Mm. So the second precondition, in my view, requires strongly um, ideal, idealistic remainers like myself to take our foot a little bit off the pedal and stop pushing people to that imaginary Damascene conversion in which they will hold their hands up and say, I got it all horribly wrong. It may happen from some people, but it will never happen in enough numbers. That is not the satisfaction we will ever get from this. The name of the game is to allow the emotional and intellectual space for people to change their minds slowly over time and to make the decision in the privacy of a polling booth to vote for something different. They don't have to admit it to anyone. They just have to admit it to themselves and their little pencil when they vote for someone. The third um, aspect of getting to a closer relationship with the EU, I think is the most difficult one. And it's the one, and it's the one that the press and commentators in this country tend to completely ignore because necessarily the coverage is Anglo-centric. And so Brexit was all about what we wanted. And therefore, people fall into the intellectual trap of thinking that rejoining is still all about what we want, forgetting that there is actually another side to this. The Europeans want, need to want the UK to come back into the fold. And that's by no means a given, okay? So what are the, what are the steps to get to that? The steps to get to that, I think, are um, a slow process of rebuilding trust. I think it's an understanding 
of the position of the UK, the real position of the UK, it has strengths and it has weaknesses. It has a perceived mythological size and it has an actual size as an economy. And I think that's why the current debate on that comes under the broad heading of cultural wars is actually really important in this context. Because what the culture wars are effectively are about an attempt to redefine Britain's character, to redefine Britain's size, strength, power, its place in the world, its past, and the resistance to redefining it. And it's absolutely vital because Brexit is based on an erroneous romantic view of the past. The amount of people who still say we were absolutely fine before the EU, therefore we will be fine after Brexit, is astonishing because the UK was not fine before the EU. It was in a terrible state before the EU. And so I think what we can do is keep supporting the voices who realistically point out that patriotism, if patriotism is love of country, for any love to be real rather than an obsession or a teenage infatuation, it has to be based on the reality. You, you can only love something that is actually there. You cannot love something that you have invented. And this is the issue with patriotism versus nationalism. Nationalism tends to love something abstract that it has created. Patriotism, in my view, is a, a critical, real love for the country that sees its past warts and all and has a realistic expectation of what its ambitions for the future are. Until we get to that point, then the Europeans, I think, will always see us with some suspicion, and rightly so, because that is at the center of what, why Brexit happened. I, I was chatting with a panelist before we opened the seminar that I am always amazed at how few people know that the UK created EFTA as a rival to the European community. So at the time when the European community first came together, the UK saw that there were benefits to the business side of it, but they didn't want any kind of political union. So they created EFTA to be the sort of business only rival to the EU. And that is a fundamental reason of why 10 years later, the EU was very hesitant to let the UK into the community because it feared that the UK wanted to subvert the community, which was always a project for the people, a project that had social and political aspects, that the UK wanted to come into it and subvert it and make it purely business. And to a certain extent, the UK did that with a single market, and it did that very successfully. But then it got to a point where essentially the coming together was getting so, um, so much closer and gathering so much momentum, especially with a single currency, that the UK had to make a decision of whether it wanted to truly be part of the European project or it wanted to jump ship. And it made the decision to jump ship. If the Europeans are to rebuild the relationship with the UK and to at some point let the UK back into Europe, Every incentive is there, don't, don't misunderstand me. I think the narrative of you know, the, the prodigal son returning um, will be a really powerful one and everyone will want that story to be true, but, they, but there will be hoops to jump through and there will be a process of rebuilding trust. And in order not to sound gloomy, what I want to add is that that's where we come in. That's where, that's where we can make the most good. Because what we can do as leaders in our community, in our family, in our company, in our university, in our organization, in our charity, at, you know, in my theater company, what we can do is
to keep communication open with our European friends and partners, to keep making the case that the British people do not want to be isolated, to keep those relationships alive so that when the politics realign, and they will, because, you know, one thing that cannot be denied is geography. So once the politics realign, there is a fertile ground there. There are relationships there, both at the organizational level, the business level, so that we're not going from a standing starting. Um, that's all I have to say as, as opening remarks. I'll hand back to Lizzie. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's a very interesting point that you make about keeping relations. And I think this past year and a half have added to the feeling of isolation, suffocation um, and alienation uh, as we are so cut off um, because of COVID as well as Brexit. So yes, I think it's a very well made point. Anyway, um, so yes, do keep putting your questions in the Q&A. Thank you for those. Um, and I'd like to introduce our second speaker, foreign correspondent and passionate filmmaker for ARD, German TV. She became known to a wide audience as a bureau chief and correspondent in, correspondent in Warsaw, New York and London. Poland, she says, was an affair of the heart, but wonderfully for us, she's made the UK her home and lives in a houseboat in Regent's Canal. You may have read her very recent analysis of the UK under Johnson in the German magazine Blätter, in which she describes how dizzying it is to live in the UK at the moment, where what is once said one day will be different tomorrow. I'm going to borrow from Colin Gordon's excellent translation and quote some lines which hit quite hard to me of the political situation in the UK. She says, truth is a currency that is currently being devalued almost every day. And as a result, few Brits still bother to keep track of things. But I hope what sets this audience apart is that those of us here tonight do want to keep track of things and of truth, and that's why we are all here. So without further ado, very much welcome, Annette Dittert. Thank you very much, Lizzie, and also thanks a lot for those opening remarks regarding uh, the floods in Germany. That is a truly catastrophic event in Germany, and that was very much appreciated. I'm from Cologne, one of the areas that have been hardest hit, and it's, it's really catastrophic. We had bad rains in London, but this is, um, yeah, much worse. Um, so thanks for that and thanks for um, mentioning my, my essay I wrote for Blätter. I'm actually very delighted and humbled to say that the New Statesman um, decided to publish it in English now as well. It went live tonight, so just as we speak. Um, so for those who want to, to have a read, they can also find it there from tonight. Um, that was a long essay for those who haven't read it um, that I felt necessary to write also for a German audience. Good to have it published here as well now, and thanks for your translation um, you did. That was also great on Twitter. It reached quite a huge audience as well. Because I think we are in a situation that is much worse than Brexit as such, but we have a government that is slowly pushing um, this country into this kind of post-truth age where not only truth as a currency doesn't matter anymore, but as it always is with these things behind that, I mean, we have a huge corruption and we have a government that doesn't really govern at the moment. I mean, everyone who has seen the speech of uh, Boris Johnson today, just waffling about leveling up. I mean, I thought that was rather scary because you could clearly see and even um, Tory, part, uh, Tory members and Brexiteers said that on Twitter just this afternoon that he just had nothing to sell. It's all headlines and it's all, I mean, politics is just headlines that are, that are made for people to forget them as yesterday's news the next day. And this kind of not just devaluing the currency of truth, but also just distorting reality. That is what I find the most worrying. And I think that's one of the reasons why so many people here can't keep up with things anymore and why beyond the shadow of the pandemics that is very handy at the moment because it, it, um, yeah, it hides so much. But beyond that, I think this constant distortion of reality is something that is a very, very dangerous weapon um, that helps the Johnson government at the moment to deflect from the damages Brexit does. Um, and, and when you look at that closer, more closely, you, it's not that astonishing that nobody really gets what's going on here at the moment. And I think that's even more dangerous than Brexit as such, which, which always was supposed to be something damaging for the country. But the way 
this government is now trying to lead the country into some kind of no man's land in a way when it comes to the truth is really is, is very, very dangerous for democracy as, as, as such as well. So that's just something just before I start really that I would like to add. And that's what I wrote about in this article. Um, also about the erosion of the rule of law, which all goes with that. Um, just sort of, uh, yeah, joining in with what Alex said, I think um, it's, it's a good idea actually to say, to, to, to put it sort of into three points. I mean, government, people, and does the EU want Britain back at all? Um, let me just start with the third um, point Alex made. I think, I agree, I think it will be very difficult to get back into the EU for Britain. Not so much because of the EU's hurt or pain, that is certainly there, but I think that narrative Alex mentioned of the Portugal son coming home will be strong. And I can, if I just take Germany, I mean, the hurt, the disappointment about Brexit has gone now in a way, it's still there, but it's, it's a little bit like um, with those disturbing years with Trump, the German government and the German people certainly as well, never really gave up on America and they have sort of rekindled that friendship with Biden now. And I think that would be very possible um, with Britain as well, the moment the tide turns here. But I also agree this cannot, most probably cannot happen with this government. And that, that is probably the biggest hurdle for it because the way the Johnson government has decided to not only treat other countries in the EU, but also the EU as a non-entity is a huge problem also for bilateral relationships with countries in the, in the EU. Just as an example, we just had a, a joint press conference with uh, Angela Merkel and, and Johnson, her sort of goodbye visit, where you could clearly see that Johnson's very interested in having some kind of bilateral relationship with Germany, but still con does not want to do the same except the EU as an entity. I mean, the petty dispute about um, not accepting the EU ambassador as such, and then having a few months later to do it anyway, because it was not really practical, um, was just one, one sign for that. But um, the problem is that, especially with Germany, it's, it's impossible for Britain to build up bilateral relations with Germany uh, when Germany has tied its foreign policy and especially its trade policy so closely to the EU. So every attempt from Britain to um, build up a bilateral relationship will always be viewed as, as, as rather suspicious from any German government that won't change in September, who, whoever will succeed Merkel. So this is an inbuilt problem with this government. I mean, by not acknowledging the reality of Europe, uh, which means you cannot just have a bilateral relationship and do everything just between countries because you don't accept multilateralism, will, will damage and burden all the bilateral relations that could be possible otherwise. So, um, and as I do not see, as Alex doesn't see this government to, to be able to get out of that trap they have put up there for themselves in a way, uh, because they would have to admit that there is a deep, deep problem in, within their project, Brexit, the way they did it especially. Um, I think um, as long as we will have this government, it will be extremely hard to, um, to get into that direction. People, I also think that it's probably, if you would ask uh, now, and if you would get away from this ideological setting, I think we do have um, a majority of people who start realizing that this was not a very good idea. And I'm not even talking about the fishermen who are directly affected or all the businesses I've been making, doing portraits about, I've talked to so many people who are really catastrophically damaged. I mean, especially smaller companies who just have, can, can go on like that anymore. Or fishermen, I mean, we just did a portrait who are, by the way, Alex, admitting to having made a mistake. And that's, that's another problem because I did, a, it's something I think we need to think about when we when want to sort of go down that road of trying to find, to get sort of people back to, onto that pro-European track in, in Britain. When I put that portrait of this Fisher man, it was a Scottish guy online who had, um, had voted for Brexit originally. He got so much abuse from the Remainer community, um, which was really massively unhelpful as well. So I think, 
these people who do say I made a mistake and this was a problem, is now a problem and I, I was being lied to. It's of no help when people jump on them and say, you idiot, it's your fault and, and, and just destroy these people. I think that tactically there needs to be more support for people who slowly realize that this was a mistake. If the remain or rejoin movement wants to ever get sort of yeah, um, speed into speed somehow. So I think, I agree, I think it will be a very difficult journey to go back into that direction. And I also think it will take a generation at least because it's, um, um, it's a, it, I think it will take a long, long time. I mean, A, to change this government with the, with the voting system we have here and B, we will probably really need a second generation. I'm not as pessimistic at times, I mean, because I think the government that we have at the moment is very, very volatile. I mean, you can see that. I mean, it's not a, they don't know. I mean, I can't see a proper, I can't see government in this government. <laughs> so if you, if you listen to the speech today of Johnson, it's, it's the, he hasn't anything. He doesn't know what he wants to do with leveling up. It's just headlines. And people will start seeing through that. Everybody is super exhausted by the pandemics at the moment, but people will start seeing through that and that could go rather fast, I think. I mean, look at what happened with Rashford and, and this football team. I mean, they have, I mean, I could, I somehow sense that, that that could be the start of some kind of change. And I think this, there could be a tipping point rather sooner than later. I mean, I'm not, Naive here. I know the voting system is a big problem, and this is to get um, the Tory party out of power with this fractioned uh, party system and with, with Labour not being really back there and, and all these other parties who just can't get in with first past the post. Of course, this will be very difficult, but I'm not so sure whether this can really go on for long because this isn't also this culture war stuff. This isn't what Britain or England is really. I mean, I've been living here now for 15 years. This is not um, how the English or pe British people are. It's so alien in a way. And I can't see this being successful in the long run. So I just make a point here now, trying to keep it a bit more optimistic. And uh, I think we can just go into the Q and A's and, and see where we are then, um, because I could go on and on and on. But I just would like to make it a bit lighter because I, I agree it will be difficult to, to change track here, but I think it's not impossible and it might happen, who knows? I mean, not sooner than later, but it might be easier than people might think at the moment at some point, but it will take time, of course. Thank you, yes. Well, we do need to cling on to a bit of hope at times. That's what I think. <laughs> um, I, 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 can, I can offer a little bit of hope um, if, it's, if it's any good to anyone. Yeah, um, always good. <laughs> so what I think might be a wedge issue that escalates very quickly and becomes the thing that actually brings the, you know, the UK back together is the environment. I think the folly of having stuff shipped from the other side of the world because you fouled up relations with your neighbours I think the folly of not cooperating on battling climate change, uh, put together with a generational shift, more young people coming up to whom this issue is much more important, and this issue becoming more important as we see freak weather events all the time. I think that might be the lever that actually becomes irrefutable. It becomes impossible for people to say that, yes, it's smart to be having our lettuce coming from Brazil and our lamb coming from New Zealand and to decimate farming in this country and not be getting tomatoes from Spain. I think that will be the, the thing that might uh, unite people around the idea that this was a bad mistake. Yeah, that's a good point, I agree. Mm. That is a good point. Well, I'm going to hand over to Geraldine, who's got a whole raft of questions, I think. Or I think it's Geraldine. Are you asking the first one? I'm asking the first question, yes. And um, a couple of people wanted to talk about Scotland. If Scotland, 
if Scotland votes for independence, will it be easy for it to rejoin the EU? And somebody else suggested that what, to ask, would Sc a Scottish vote for independence be a big enough shock to the rest of the UK to rethink its relationship with the EU? Should I answer that straight? Like, yes, please. I, I think there is one big link missing. The, question, the thing is whether there ever will be a referendum and whether the Johnson government will let the Scots have that referendum. I mean, that's the biggest caveat here. Um, once that is done, I think, from having talked to people inside the EU and MEPs about that a lot lately, as I did a longer feature on Scotland and the independent, I think it will be relatively easy to rejoin for Scotland. Once the referendum is there, this is, this is not a big problem this time, because Spain was the biggest opponent last time, but mostly because of the Catalonia issue and um, because it was too comparable. Now, this is a completely different situation. Scotland has been dragged out of the EU against its will, so it's not comparable to the Catalonia situation anymore. So Spain will not stand in the way as it did before. And when you look at the criteria for joining the EU, I mean, that is something that Scotland can do in five minutes because it has been a member of the EU. And everybody I talk to in, in, inside the MEP, uh, inside the European Parliament, and more or less said to me, sort of off record, one, we won't meddle in that now because it's not our thing. We won't say anything publicly. And we obviously have to wait for a referendum and the referendum that decides the independence. But once that's done, it won't be a big deal this time. So I think that is something those in Scotland who are rather, yeah, in favor of independence can be rather relaxed about. I think the bigger stumbling stone is for those who want independence for Scotland is to get to that point. Thank you. Alex, do you have any thoughts about this? Um, only that um, I have a cheeky suspicion that a border poll in Ireland might happen before um, Scottish independence, actually. Um, I've just had this feeling in my waters that the, it, it, we might see a united Ireland before we see a, an independent Scotland. But whether the effect of either of those things would be to convince the rest of the UK that it was a mistake, I'm not sure. I think it might actually have the opposite effect, seeing as the engine of Brexit was always quite an English nationalism. I'm afraid that they might just go, fine then, good riddance, and be become even more entrenched in their isolationism. But I don't know. It's hard to say. I mean, but I agree. I mean, if you look at the, I just saw a few polls recently that big majority of the Tory voters uh, who voted for Brexit don't give a toss about Scotland. I mean, mm. they, couldn't, they couldn't care less. So I, I agree, it might just end up with a little England that goes, that gets more and more isolated and will be more and more, um, yeah, because it's true. I mean, Brexit was in, in the essence a project of English nationalism uh, and, and never, they never really had the Scots on board. Um, and, um, but, but in, I found that really, to be honest, very striking when I saw these polls. Mm. Because, I mean, the whole thing about Great Britain and the UK and then Scotland, what the hell? This is so, um, yeah, it was for me very surprising when I first understood that, that for most of the Brexiteers, it's not such a big issue. It's more about, of course, Johnson doesn't want to lose Scotland and end up as the prime minister who broke up the United Kingdom, but broke Great Britain. But um, I, I think it, it won't... It won't be, a, I think it will have the opposite effect. I agree with Alex, yeah. Mm. I, I sometimes think the Brexiteers are like, is it Millwall supporters who sing, everyone hates <laughs> us and we don't care? Yeah. Um, so I think um, Peter has a question now. Hey, Geraldine. Oh, it's you, Susan. Okay. Yeah. That's a question from Mike Cashman. And He's asking, what will awake the undecided or apathetic middle? We sometimes refer to them as the soft middle of the population to reject a government which lies about Europe, lies about Brexit, lies about COVID and just about everything else. Alex, do you want to have a crack at that one first? 
Um, the bleak answer would be nothing. You know, they're called the apathetic middle for a reason, because they're apathetic. No, I, I, I think these things take time. I think the time will come when, um, like the Brexit, I think when the Brexit, the Brexit question was asked, was asked, everyone had an instinctive response. And I think that's roughly the 52-48 we ended up with. I, I think the hand-wringing and economic forecasts and back and forth and debating in between changed very few minds, actually. Uh, I think most people had a gut reaction. And I think in a few years' time, most people will have similarly a gut reaction when you ask them, do you feel that you've taken back control? They will have an internal answer that forms in their mind instantly. They will either feel like they are in more control or not. And then they will know that it was a lie. Similarly, I think there will be a time when people will be able to answer the question, do you feel like you've leveled up? You see, that's the problem with all these easy, rhetorical, three-word devices, is that they mean nothing but actually they're quite easy to answer down the road. You know, it's really quite easy for someone to know in 10 years time, if they feel like they've taken back control, if they feel like they've leveled up, built back better. And people will have an answer to that that is instinctive and it will most likely be right. And that I think changes the landscape. The landscape. But until then, I think progressives and Labour in particular have to understand why Johnson is popular. I think this is a real obstacle for us. It's a real stumbling block because I cannot fathom how anyone would like that liar, that cheat, that, you know, he reminds me of every bully I knew in school. And so I cannot understand how anyone could vote for him. And so that makes it impossible for me to create a battle plan for defeating him. If I, if I shout at him, you're a liar, I'm simply magnifying equality for which the electorate actually like him. The, the electorate actually like the fact that he's a little bit all over the place and he's a clown and he breaks the rules and he's a bit of a misogynist and he's a bit of a racist, you know? because they see their flaws in him. And so until we manage to identify what it is people like about him, genuinely, without dismissing it, we will not be able to come up with a, a battle plan for defeating him. Thank you, Alex. Annette, is there anything you'd like to add? It's really hard for me to, to answer that question, what could get this rather apathetic soft middle or however you call it to to wake up i i mean i i think it's part of the especially english mentality which i normally find extremely sym sympathetic and charming that you don't start like the germans who whenever a traffic light doesn't work they write letters and 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 uh, get on your nerves with this um <laughs> it's, it's something i rather like always about living here which obviously when it comes to big up political question and about life and, and into lives like during the COVID um, pandemic and this catastrophic mismanagement of Johnson that never was really an issue here, which I really didn't understand anymore. I still don't understand that. I mean, what they're doing now is really costing lives and they know it and nobody stops them. It's almost like there is an internal death wish here in, the, in, in England, especially. Scots are certainly different. Um, so I don't really know how to, uh, how, what could change that. But as I said, on the other hand, I think it's very, I mean, what I said before, I feel the situation is not very stable. It's very volatile. And, and when you see how quickly the whole thing turned after with this whole racism thing with Rashford and Saka and how much, I mean, the tweet that the first guy did had within four hours had 500,000 likes where he was just calling them out about lying. Mm -hmm. and this 
this will cut through eventually, I think, and this might go faster than one thinks. And it sometimes comes from a totally unexpected corner. I don't want to. Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, I, I agree. I've said many times before that the person that will defeat Johnson will be Johnson. Um, oh, that it, it will be the hubris and the overreach yeah. that eventually makes him extend to such a degree that people will go, no, not in my name. Mm. Um, and, and it's interesting that it was a very similar issue to taking the knee that meant progressives finally managed to unite in America. Exactly. And and uh, come out in large numbers to vote for Joe Biden because effectively Trump got, got to a stage where he was feeling so invulnerable, he said and did stuff that may have pleased his base, but that got his opponents' backs so up that they were they wanted it more. Mm -hmm. And that's the answer here. I think the more confident Johnson feels, the more he will overreach. And at some point that will galvanize his opponents to simply want to get him out of office more than conserv conservatives want to keep him there. There's, there's one additional thing that is important, I think, when it, when it comes to Trump and the way it ended. That was the media. You suddenly had a very emboldened CNN who stood up to him. Um, and that's something that is sadly really missing here. I mean, I'm, I don't know how often I've been shouting at the radio in the morning and I hear BBC Radio 4. They've become a bit better. It's, I'm not, I don't want to generalize too much, but that is a huge issue. I mean, the media, the BBC is so frightened um, that they just don't speak up to it anymore. I mean, I mean, we had this case with Emily Maitley saying, Coming, the coming story that you all will remember, uh, which really wasn't a big thing. She just said what, what was true that day. And the BBC uh, TV director, Fran Anselm, she just apologized the morning after without even talking to the desk or to the, to the Newsnight team or Emily Makers, just to calm down everything. And the whole Robbie Gibbs story now, I mean, this is so outrageous that you put someone on the board who is Gen more or less says you can put that person in a news editor I mean, she's not even a board member in this case and then i mean i haven't heard any anything about this how this has now ended but that is i think a very important point i think people who want to get this country back on a more democratic track need to somehow find a way of supporting the bbc and the media channel 4 as well who is about to be privatized because without some kind of public television or public media, you can't do it. You need a corrective, you need that. And they're almost, yeah, they're almost hibernating at the moment. And that and, is- and this is, and this is, I think, why people that like Marcus Rashford are so terrifying to them. Yes. Because he can just tweet something yeah. and cut through to more people than read the Telegraph, the Daily Mail, the Sun and the Express put together and multiply by 10. And that's power to shape the narrative directly to the public is their kryptonite. Yeah, yeah that's why I said it could come from a very unexpected corner. Yeah, it could come. It, it could be footballers that save us all. <laughs> <laughs> that's, um, that would be very interesting to have footballers save us all. And I don't care where the saviour comes from as long as as long as they come. Um, thank you, Annette. Thank you, Alex. I think Peter has the next question for you. Peter? To some extent, I think um, you've touched upon this because I know you're both very interested in the media and the uh, position of the BBC. Um, but there was a particular aspect of it that was raised by um, Colin Gordon. And it says, um, some topics like the Russia report and Aaron Banks' money have now been shut down in the media by legal and or other threats. Uh, apart from a few heroic re rebels, do we have a free media anymore? And I suppose part of that is what can be done by this sort of culture of using the law in that way? Sorry, I didn't really hear you by that culture. Of yeah, sorry. Um, legal threats uh, oh. against uh, anybody who uh, speaks out That's a um, about problem. the Russia report yeah. and Aaron Banks. 
I mean, that's not just Aaron Banks. I mean, he's constantly suing people into into submission, but it's also about like people like Catherine Belton. I've not, I'm not sure whether you're aware of that case who's been writing a book on Putin and now being sued by British um, British lawyers via, I mean, by Putin basically via British lawyers and can't speak up either. He would have a lot to say to um, when it comes to corruption in this country as well. Um, this is a huge problem. I'm, I think it would be possible to fix that um, politically, but there is no willingness on, on the side of this government at all, of course not. Um, and that's, yeah, that, I have no solution to that. I just think it's a big problem. And it's, um, I mean, the whole, I mean, the whole, we don't need to talk about that here, but I mean, the, the referendum was as such advisory and, um, and it was sort of, uh, yeah, fought through with partly illegal measures, but it doesn't play a role because, I mean, power has just taken over. And um, and I think there's nowhere back to that, really. I don't think that's a battle we, people who want to rejoin the EU should still fight because that's yesterday. I think it's just really now, what is now important is to make sure that, as we said before, that the conversation doesn't break off, that we try to find ways to keep the relations especially with younger people alive i mean erasmus is gone the school exchanges are partly gone because it's too complicated i've just talked to a um, few schools in germany who want to do still school exchanges it has been very much it's much more complicated than it was before they don't get the funding they got before for it i think that's what people who want to rejoin should or who want to get britain closer to the eu that's what they should focus on. I think the whole, the past about this whole referendum, it's no, it doesn't really make sense to keep going on that. I mm. think. Alex, um, I think I think we have a free media, media still. I'm not sure we have a curious media or a curious enough media. Um, so it's not so much that they're often prevented from reporting something. It's just that it seems to me they, they're a little bit lazy almost, that they fail to interrogate the basic facts of things they're reporting. And so it has become reportage rather than journalism. You know, the classic quote is that reportage is to say that person A says it's raining, person B says it's sunny, journalism is to look out the window and see which is true. Um, and I don't think there's enough of that going on. But like I said, media is a fast changing landscape at the moment. Um, and whether it comes to the point that the BBC has less left to lose, I think there is a weird tipping point where they can frighten the BBC with doing this and doing that and it works to keep them in line but there is a there is a tipping point over which if the BBC feels that this government has be, become an existential threat it might actually come out fighting and I saw that in Greece with uh, the, the sort of national uh, television radio station there, Ert, uh, when they towed the line while there were still sort of a job to protect and an organization to protect. But when it came to the point that they were facing basically becoming Pravda, they came out fighting and came out fighting very hard. So, you know, I mean, the, the TV license is a classic example of you want, you want the TV license review to always be a threat in the horizon, but you always end up renewing it because that's its value. Its value is being a threat in the horizon. If the government ended up taking away the TV license money from the BBC, then they wouldn't have that huge lever against it. And maybe the BBC would decide that, okay, fine, game on. <laughs> So it's a delicate balance, I mean, but, yeah. but I, I agree with, uh, with uh, uh, Annette on the first point she was making, that 
the Brexit referendum stuff is in that weird Götterdämmerung, to use the German word, where it's not recent enough to be topical and not old enough to be historic. I think there will be a look at what happened around the referendum, but it will be in 10 years' time. And because it's now past but not past enough to really investigate it in detail and have people speaking out about it, I, th I think it, it's not something that we should be pressing. Thank you very much. Uh, Geraldine, I think you had a question next. Oh, you're on mute, Geraldine. Geraldine, you're... Yes, um, this is a question from Sarah Murphy and it's about trust. And she's asking, how can the people of the UK rebuild trust, trust in the EU, and presumably how people in the EU can build trust in the UK, when our government and the press trashes the EU more and more each day? And we're not them. We're the voice of the majority. How is it to be heard? I answer. I mean, I I think most people do know that there's a difference between this government and and, and the British people. Um, even those who are maybe not watching the news every day. I mean, I'm just speaking for Germany at the moment. But I think the very simple answer is: as long as this government is in power, the way it's acting uh, on a political level, there will be no rebuilding of trust. It won't, just won't happen because. Um, the way Frost and Johnson are trashing and destroying every little inch of hope that trust might be rebuilt, it, it's really relentless. And I think in, inside, within Brussels and also within the German government, I mean, they basically have more or less given up on it. And they, that's my, my interpretation of what I'm seeing. I'm, I'm not speaking for them, but... Um, I think that's why Angela Merkel was here also to try to rebuild at least to keep, as I said, keep the kind of channels afloat, rebuild on a, on a bilateral minimal level, something that can still be rekindled once, once a government uh, is, is, is in power, who's, which could be a Tory government, but who's a bit more reasonable about that. But I think as long as Johnson and Frost keep sticking to, to this deal and keep lying about it and keep announcing that they will break international law, which was probably the worst thing they did so far when it comes to destroying trust. Um, this will simply not be possible. And I think it's just very, it's, it's, I think for quite a long time at the moment, we will have to, people who are interested in keeping up the EU-British relations or German-British relations or Greek, Greek or Spanish-French-British relations, we just have to be, do it on a really, school day-to-day -day basis try to keep everything on a local communal school exchange and really simple day-to-day -day things to not let this this conversation break off but as long as this government is in place the way they are acting at the moment I think there is I can't see trust being rebuilt anytime soon um I would only add to that that my one ray of hope is what happened after Biden came into office, that there was such a, a palpable relief by the global community that they didn't have to deal with that clown anymore, that actually a lot of stuff was sort of swept aside and, and, you know, America was very much welcomed back, back to the uh, uh, international community. And maybe we will see a wave of goodwill towards a future prime minister that is not uh, someone who seeks to actively undermine. But as far as the press's uh, portrayal of uh, Europe is concerned. I mean, that's been a long time coming. I heard a, a very interesting retrospective documentary on how the relationship of the UK and the EU was redefined really in the middle period of Thatcher, you know, the, the sort of up yours Delors uh, 
uh, atmosphere where instead of a cooperative relationship where, you know, we were partners trying to find common solutions to common problems, the relationship with Europe was redefined as one of a conflict where you had you had to hand back people in order to get your fair share. Otherwise, those crafty Europeans would take it away from you. And I, th I think it had, perceptions in Britain have never recovered from that. It is still seen, even by pro-Europeans, as essentially a zero-sum game of conflict in which there are winners and losers. Um, and that, again, might need to be generational. It, and it might need to be, uh, to have to do with a more uh, uh, holistic and collaborative approach to politics in general, which is also why I think a progressive alliance would be very helpful, because it would switch people out of that mode of thinking that these are my people, that is the enemy, Everyone that's not on my side is against me. It would get them to thinking of, okay, what common goals do I have with this group of people and how can we work together to get them? Well, thank you for those. And um, I think Susan is going to ask the next question. Yes, thank, thank you, Geraldine. Um, this next question is for you, Alex. It's from Charlotte. And she asks, should we attack this government first on other non-Brexit issues, for example, the crony COVID contracts? Um, I mean, obviously, yes, um, because it's not, you know, it's not an invented point. The Prime Minister stood up in the House of Commons yesterday and said that we had to cut foreign aid because every pound we spend on aid is borrowed at the same time as, you know, awarding billions of pounds to mates for unusable PPE, of going down the road of outrageous vanity projects that we know will never come true because we have his mayorship of London to look back on. So we know what happened to the Garden Bridge, the Island Airport, the funicular, the, you know, this is his, this is his MO. He is a child with toy railways and Lego roads and Meccano bridges, but he has no idea of how that stuff relates to the real world. So I think absolutely we should be saying if, if your position is that we can't help vaccinate babies from malaria and money is a scarce resource when it comes to giving nurses a proper pay rise, then why is all this money going to consultants and jobs for mistresses and gold wallpaper and the royal yacht, which no one wants, you know, so I think he's made a really uh, a powerful rod for his own back, actually, by pretending for a moment to be fiscally conservative. I think he has made it fair game for everyone to say, hmm, what about this money? What about that money that you're spending there? Why is that a priority over giving nurses to pay rise? Why do we need a roundabout under the Isle of Man? or a bridge to Ireland, or, or all those ridiculous things, or Trident, or HS2, actually, or half-finished nuclear power stations. I mean, everything he touches turns to shit, pretty much. So I think that is a very verdant line of attack, to be pointing to the things he spends money on and saying, you promised X million to the NHS. Where's that, please? That was a fabulous answer. I'm slightly conscious of the time for you, Alex. Are you still? Well, no one's tried to kick me out yet. So. Okay. <laughs> Let's keep going until they do. 
Marvellous. Thank you. Uh, anything, anything you wanted to add to that? No, I think we've covered everything. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Well, in fact, I was going to ask Richard Wilson to ask his question. He's, he's here at the moment. We'll just try and bring him into the room. Bear with me a second. Yes, I'm here, Peter. Thank you very much. Um, I'm trying to remember what my question was, but it was, I think it was basically along the lines of um, how do we persuade the opposition party to actually start making even the most basic tentative steps towards uh, reversing the hardest Brexit, uh, because obviously we can't wait five, seven, eight years for, for something to start to happen with a change of government. We need, if we do get a change of government in 2024, which is a prerequisite for anything happening really, uh, we do need the opposition to at least start uh, on the road back towards a better relationship with Europe. Shall I take that first? Yeah. Um, I, I think that's a tough one because I'm not sure that saying right now our aim is a closer relationship to Europe does not ensure we don't get a change of government. Um, I think it's very difficult to sell undoing something as a narrative. I think it would be much better to concentrate the labor story on what it is offering to people as a prospectus, to say that with us, life will be like this. I mean, that's the basic proposition of any government. That's why any government gets elected. Any government gets elected because they promise people that their life will be better, that their children's life will be better than their, their own. And so that's the narrative you have to build. People don't actually care that much how it happens. If they decide to put someone else in charge and that person then thinks that we should rejoin the customs union, for instance, because that would make life much easier for people in Northern Ireland. I think having made the decision to put that person in charge, you sort of accept the judgment on these issues. Whether it's smart for that person to go around making rejoining the customs union a central campaign pledge, I'm not so sure because it is a very, it's a pretty direct way of telling people you made a mistake and you need to undo it, which never wins an election. What wins an election is we are where we are. Let's make things better. Sorry, but Alex, at least it offers a choice, doesn't it? <laughs> I, look, I feel, I feel yes. you, Richard. You know, you're my spirit animal here. I, I want this so much, but I also understand that politically, it might be counterproductive. I mean, this is what the Tories do better than Labour, always. They concentrate on what's the story that will get them into power. And once they're in there, as you have seen, manifesto pledges go out the window. How, the promises they made to get there don't matter at all. You know, that's, that is what they're really good at. And I think we have unreasonable demands of our progressive politicians to always be banging the drum for the issue that is central to us, even when that ensures they never get into power. And I think we have to grow out of that. And it pains me to say it. But it, you know, it may be that an easier route towards a closer relationship to the EU is to never talk about the EU between now and 2024, as much as I want to. So that's, basically the labor, that's basically the Labour strategy in a way, but I can't see that being very successful either. I mean, I, I mean I'm, I'm not an activist, I'm an observer and a journalist, and I find it interesting, but also a bit 
frustrating to watch the Labour Party at the moment because they kept having sort of voted for the deal, having done exactly what you said, Alex, they just can't really um, stand up and say what is bad about Brexit and, and they can't talk about the damages it does, which would be a crucial and central point of any opposition in this situation. And that's such a trap as well. And um, I find that very difficult to see how they get out of that. I mean, just to say we have to make things better now and not to point, not being able to point to the damage Brexit does to the country is also difficult because sooner or later, this will, people will, it will dawn on people that this has damaged their businesses, that this has damaged their village. And then there's nobody who can stand up and say, yeah, well, we, we told you so, or that's what we always said, but the Labour Party is sort of complicit in this now. I, 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 I agree. I mean, I agree completely, but at the same time, you know, I play out in my head, Labour saying those things, and what an easy attack line this opens yes. to the Conservatives to say, we're trying to vaccinate the nation and you're banging on about Brexit. Yeah. It, it is so simple and so lethal. A point that, to test that anyway. I mean, whatever Sama says. It's that's just hard. It's hard, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Do we have further questions? Mm -hmm. or... Oh, Geraldine. Geraldine next. Yes, I've got a question and it's from Joe Steele. As you two are EU citizens living in the UK, can you say how the EU now views us? Do they see us as being able to reform, to rejoin, or are we too far on the road to the right, following Hungary and Poland, and therefore dangerous? Interesting question. I mean, Hungary and Poland are still inside the EU, and certainly at the moment, the bigger problem, by the way, because they're trying to destroy it from within. Um, and that might um, be a very important point uh, in so far as, as a Great Britain in the state it is now would certainly not be welcome back. But I think that that will be the question anyway. So uh, I think it will be a bit like we, we discussed earlier, like with Biden, with, with the change of government and the different situation in the country, I think of course a Britain will be welcome back. But at the moment in the situation we are now, it's neither, yeah, it, it won't happen anyway, but also the EU wouldn't be very well advised to take Britain back in the state it is in now, I think. But it's, yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I mean, I have family in Scandinavia, in Belgium and in Greece. So I sort of keep an eye out on newspapers and news stories from three countries. And I, I think most people are still quite baffled, actually. I think the overwhelming emotion is, why did you do that? Um, but I think, interestingly, recently, it feels like there's, things have gotten quite a lot worse because the COVID issue plays into it. Because I have to tell you, in the press out there on, on continental Europe, the fact that, you know, Europe is now battling a second variant that they see very much as something that came from the UK. Mm -hmm. And not by accident, but because this government allowed it to flourish and be exported. I, I, my fear is that things might get worse before they get better. I think the UK might end up on a red list all of its own, where basically everyone goes, you know, you, wanna, you want it to be alone, guess what? You get your wish. You want it close borders, have them. <laughs> um, so, but again, like, like the question about the opposition, we've lived through such a traumatic year where everything has been overtaken by COVID, that coming out of it, who knows how everything will drop into place? The table has been overturned. And it's very difficult to predict, um, you know, whether people will come to see 
the UK as someone who played their cards very well with the vaccination program, or um, you know how the economic recovery will go after COVID is less of an issue than it is now. It will be very easy to point to you know the line of recovery in the rest of Europe versus the line of recovery in the UK, and it will be very hard to argue that those things are not connected, you know, that they're not showing us two parallel realities, one of a confederation of nations that acted in a risk averse way, and one of a nation that sees itself as a buccaneer and takes risks, and which one paid off better. My suspicion is that um, the UK will end up with uh, the worst health results and economic results of the rest of Europe. And I think that will be a very difficult position for this government to defend. But we'll see. Thank you. It's Susan, I think you have a question. Now. Well, I've, I've got a question to, to ask, if I may. This came in from Christopher Davison. And he's made two points. First of all, in the referendum, 73% of the people in the UK did not vote to leave the European Union. Um, actual news from Europe is rarely covered by the UK media. What, if anything, have European st states learned from the Brexit experience? I appreciate you've touched upon this, but uh, maybe to enlarge uh, a little bit from the point of view of the countries you know best. Um, maybe you could ask Alex first if you're, if you're still okay to ask questions, to answer questions. Um I, I mean, I hope the European Union has and will learn a lot from this experience, because the fact of the matter is that there is a more vibrant pro-European movement in the UK now than there ever was while the UK was a member of the EU. You know, a lot more people understand the benefits of the EU now than did when we were in the EU. And so I think um, the European Union, my view is it has to be more aggressive in the way it pursues uh, a media strategy. I think it's been quite sluggish so far. It's been happy to be seen as effectively a body of civil servants that's doing work in the background, but it hasn't um, been as forthcoming about celebrating its successes um, at the national level, you know, at the level that matters. And so I think, I hope the lesson it takes back is that you need support for the project at every level of governance, from local to national. And if you allow any layer of that to atrophy, it becomes a weakness through which trouble seeps in. They allowed that to happen, I think, at the um, sort of community level in the UK. They've, they allowed it to happen, I think, at the government level in Hungary. I think there was a mission creep there. I think a much firmer reaction to some of uh, Orban's early transgressions would have avoided them uh, now being in a position where basically they have to debate whether to kick Hungary out or not, and would have shown the Hungarian people that someone was thinking that this wasn't the right way to, to go. So you can't be political and also not get involved in politics. So they have to decide if they are also a political union, then they have to get involved in the politics of the countries that are part of the union. You can't be half in, half out. Thank you. Uh, Annette, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a discussion for another panel, basically, but that's a big <laughs> problem, of course. And I, it's not as easy as Alex made it look now, because I mean, the EU hasn't been built like that. I mean, there is this unanimous vote that you need. And it was from the very beginning. I mean, I've been the correspondent in Poland for quite a while and I went back there in 2014 and 
with another documentary on how the this authoritarian system had sort of taken over. That's why I'm so, yeah, why that's so clear to me how these things start. Um, at least I saw it there. Um, and um, the problem was the EU always tried in, po in, the, in the case of Poland very early on, um, but it's, it wasn't easy because it's, it's a very, it's a system that has been built as we have discussed earlier, uh, sort of in a very passionate, yeah, idealistic way after the war. And, and nobody, it, the factor that this could be destroyed from within was never foreseen and it's not mm. built in. So as long as you ha don't have a majority vote there, you will be, it will be very hard to kick anybody out or even to do something like the Polish justice system has been attacked for years and years now. The, the Polish opposition has been in Brussels 10,000 times. I accompanied them there. They tried to convince um, the parliament, the, the commission, and it was to no avail because it's very hard to do that when you don't have a majority system there. The EU isn't built like a state. The EU isn't built as a system where it can tell nation states what to do. That, that is this big misunderstanding from here that always at Britain, it was always de depicted here as a, as a kind of super state, it's not. And that makes it so difficult. That was part of the sluggish vaccination start. That was one of the elements why it was so difficult. The EU is not a super state. It's a, it's a kind of a voluntary, um, yeah, bündnis, uh, how do you say that in English anyway, um, a voluntary union of, of states. And there is a few things that are decided jointly, but it's, it's you cannot, that would be the next step. There has been a lot of people in Brussels saying, now as Britain is gone, we can maybe start to integrate this further. And maybe that would be the right direction. But um, yeah, I think the EU is in a very fragile state at the moment. And, and the problem they have with Hungary and Poland is not to be underestimated. Oh, I, I agree, but we're talking about lessons learned and how we go forward. And all I'm saying is that we have ended up in a situation where if Hungary or Poland were applying for membership today, there would be several areas that they would fail under Absolutely. And yet, having secured membership, there is no mechanism for saying you are failing in these areas. Yeah, that and that, that, that obviously yeah. needs to be addressed. It obviously needs to be addressed. There, need, there needs to be some sort of penalty box, doesn't there? There needs to be some sort of sin bin where you say, unless you sort this out, there's no more money from us. Yeah, they're because trying to do that now. I mean, it's it's happening, but it's difficult. No. I mean, it's it's too much. I know, I know, I know. So very well spoken. I suspect that the UK, had it stayed in, might be at risk of being in the sin bin, unfortunately. But uh, we'll hold that thought. Um, I'll pass over to Susan for the final question. Thank you. Um, it's from Jenny Phillips, and she's asking, how do you explain to people in your birth countries why the English voted for? and support Brexit. And I will just add, and if they're even interested to know, um, who'd like to go first, Annette? Yeah, I mean, I mostly try, I mean, the, the, let's say the year after it happened was very difficult to talk to anybody in Germany about Britain because they were all so disappointed and I mean, really deeply hurt. Um, that has changed now. Most people have sort of factored it in now. And what I mostly do, I mean, that's what I do as a job. I mean, reporting on Britain on a daily basis and whenever it, it, it makes any sense I try to factor in that this is not a majority view but that it's sort of like 30 I don't know 7 38 maybe 40 percent who voted for it and I keep trying to explain that it, the people is one thing and this government is another one I and mean, of course they were voted in but that was a very specific situation so I try to explain that more or less every day and, um, and, and yeah, and as we have mentioned or discussed before, I think there will be a huge preparedness to welcome Britain back and, and, and to welcome the British people back. And on a, on a day to day basis, I mean, Germans still, I mean, I'm just talking about Germany because that's where I'm from, but the German people do still love Britain and England. And they're very, very, I mean, they're almost sometimes romanticizing a bit much. And I have to counter that as well. But, um, that deep sitting friendship or yeah, whatever it is, a sentiment uh, from Germany towards this little island, it's still there. And I think 
Um, it has been a bit rattled, but it's not gonna go away. I think this will change as with Trump when there is another government. Thank you, Inez. Alex. Greek people, I'm afraid, are less charitable <laughs> in, their, in their view. Um, I mean, there's a huge amount of affection, I think, for British people and a huge amount of affection for British culture. You know, British comedy, British music is revered in Greece. The British education system is revered in Greece. It still counts for a hell of a lot to say, I studied in the UK, you know? There's a real cachet to that. But I think the experience of the events around the civil war in the 60s and then Cyprus in the 70s, I think have taught Greek people that when it comes to foreign policy, the UK misfires quite frequently, does the wrong thing quite frequently. And so I think there is less surprise in that way. Um, I, I guess what I try to explain is that it's cultural. It is cultural and it does go all the way back to the war, I'm afraid, because you know the reason, the reason when Greece joined the EU, the celebration in Greece was phenomenal. I mean, it was truly a, a, a day of national joy. And I think that goes back to how much of a traumatic experience the war was from Greece, as it was for most of Europe. So we lost 10% of our population, you know, in, in total, in, in sort of uh, fighting, in famine, in uh, uh, sort of concentration camps, etc. we lost 10% of our population. So for us to now be in a situation of friendship and cooperation with Germany is a big deal. You know, it is a healing of a past that is incredibly traumatic. And so I think we value it differently. I read a a, an extraordinary uh, piece by Fintan O'Toole a, a few months ago that said every country um, in Europe came out of World War II traumatized in some way, feeling there was loss and grief in some way, except the UK. The UK came out of World War II feeling better about itself than it did when it went in. And so the cultural heritage of that, the wish to never have that happen again, to unite as a continent, is simply at different levels in Greece or Germany or France than it has ever been in the UK. Well, maybe not now. You know, now I think there is a thriving pro-European movement in the UK. It, you know, it's a little too late, but it's there was the most expensive education project ever <laughs> on the <laughs> <internet>. Yes, yes. <laughs> but, the lesson, but the lesson for the UK was very different, you see. They were looking for an identity post-imperial. They were, you know, in bad economic trouble. They, you know, and they came out of the war actually with renewed optimism, with renewed confidence, building the NHS, building the welfare state. So actually that process, although traumatic, left them in a better state in many ways it, for every country in Europe that wasn't the case. So the primary uh, objective was never again. We must connect ourselves to the extent that we can never be enemies again. And that overriding principle is just not there for the UK for historical reasons. They don't get it. I mean, the Brexiters don't get it, why it's necessary. Thank you very much both. We all get it, but I, I, I see where you're coming from, Alex, on that. Yeah, I think uh, we all do get it, and that's why we're all here tonight. 
And that's why we feel so un unrepresented because there is no political voice of any strength making the case uh, in parliament for us. Not very loud, not loud enough as we would like. Anyway, thank you so much both for a fantastically illuminating evening. It's been, you know, a joy to listen to you both. And if I may, I'm going to end the evening on a little bit of hope and quote again from a piece written by Alex. And he says in this piece, um, and it's written, what I really think is relevant here, he writes it to the British people as a Greek um, citizen, or well, living in London still, but um, with Greek heritage and says to us in 2015, together we can get over this bump in the road. Together we can prove that solidarity and democracy may have fizzled out as institutional concepts, but they are stronger than ever within people's hearts. I thank you in advance, my country thanks you. And I'd like to extend that back to the two of you and thank you very much for tonight. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you. Just to make a couple of remarks in conclusion. First of all, I have the pleasant, pleasant duty of thanking our chair, Lizzie, uh, who's done a superb job, thank you very much, and to thank both speakers. And um, one thing that will, I mean, obviously many of the words you've spoken will resonate in my mind. I think it's interesting hearing Alex talking about the unique recollections of the war in Britain. It, it always struck me as an Irish person coming over, listening to English people saying that they had a good war. I suspect that's something that didn't happen in many other countries. Uh, it's a bit like saying, did you have a good lockdown? Um, and um, I mean, to both of you, I, I would say, you know, you represent the perspective that you take from your country very, very well. Different perspectives, but overlapping and interlocking. And um, both of you, I, I would say to the people on this call, and there are still 120 people um, on, the, on this call, um, have a look at our website, because both of our speakers have uh, a, a superb um, uh, stable of books and publications, and um, I can strongly recommend them. And I think Annette, uh, for example, with her views as a German uh, of life in Britain and the British outlook on life, I think she captures that very well, both in her you know, books and in the publication you're about to get in The New Statesman. And as for Alex, um, one of the questions I had on the um, on the chat was, uh, please, can you ask Alex to sing? So uh, we can't tonight, but that's for the next time. Um, one of his many talents. Um, I was going to say a quick word about our organization, Oxford for Europe, because we are always open to supporters. Many of you will have signed up uh, at registration, and you can find out more on our website, oxfordforeurope.org. Um, please have a look there and um, join us. We are all, also always open to donations. As you know, these meetings are free, but we do welcome donations. We will have a, our PayPal account running again very soon. And uh, they're used very effectively for our media campaigns. I'll say a quick word about Susan, who's on this call at the moment, um, who is leading our media team very effectively. So look out for that. Um, and finally, I just want to say a couple of words about forthcoming meetings. So we have the pleasure on the 27th of this month of uh, being addressed by Andrew Adonis, who's the chair of the European Movement. And um, as all of you have come across him, will know he will speak uh, again very well. Here's, an, here's another um, speaker we've been very lucky to have. And then on the 18th of August, we're going to uh, be joined by AC Grayling in a joint meeting uh, hosted by um, Berkshire for Europe and Hampshire for Europe. Um, and then a quick word about our, um, our fellow organization, uh, Grassroots for Europe. Um, again, you can Google it. Uh, Richard Wilson, whom you saw earlier, is the chair. And they again are hosting a meeting uh, shortly on the 22nd of July, um, once again with AC Grayling. So those are all things to uh, look out for. You can put your appetite on all of them. Um, so that's really all I wanted to say. And it just remains for me once again uh, to say uh, thank you to everyone and thank you all for joining us. And until next time, au revoir. Thank Auf you Wiedersehen. very much. And thanks to Colin Gordon as well for having translated the first version. That's what I wanted to say all the time. Uh -huh. Thank you.